Okay, good morning. Good morning, mummies. Love to see so many of you on the call that I already know. Some are hiding behind the iPhone, but you're still very welcome. <laughs> I don't always see your names, but that's okay. Uh, thank you for spending this morning with us. And we've got a very exciting guest speaker today who's been on the call before and has shared all of her knowledge on homeopathy, which um, is one of our most gentle healing modalities and therefore so, so important for moms in pregnancy who are really struggling to find um, something to treat even the common cold. And then also for you mummies to double a little bit, learn to double a little bit in homeopathy and use it for your children, because I find for children, it's even more powerful than it is for adults, because I find they don't have as many layers that we need to peel back. And I think they respond to homeopathy so quickly. And it's always fascinating to see that. So welcome, Rukshin. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. I know you yourself are quite a firm believer and practitioner of homeopathy. So it means a lot that you trust my guidance for your uh, students today. Absolutely. So, yes. I'm really excited to learn from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's get right to it. I think uh, the reason that a lot of uh, mothers are here today is because you know, children fall sick. They're looking for more natural, more uh, safer modalities to use for their kids. And unfortunately, what I see in my practice is the day in and day out, the mothers that come in come with these huge doctor and medical files. The kids have gone from one GP to one pediatrician to the other to the other. And ultimately, you know, they haven't been able to come to the crux of why their child is falling sick again and again. And they're completely lost and and just kind of hopeless by the end of it and looking for just someone to be able to get them out of the circle. And I feel like the only way that that happens is when you understand exactly what is happening with your child's body. And so today I will talk to you a little bit about immunity. I will talk to you a little bit about what we're looking at treating in children. And then we'll discuss a little bit about homeopathy and you know how it works and a few of the remedies that are good for you to keep at home and how to use it for your children in day to day. Yeah, because so, I think that is so special about homeopathy that it's not just acute treatment of symptoms, but it actually looks at the person and their constitution. And so it gives you a better baseline and maintenance, I guess, uh, to achieve overall better health. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So every child that comes to me for even, you know, a cold and a cough, when I'm working on their immune system, it will be a 45 minute to a one hour case history, where I completely have to understand the child, their personality, their behavior, a lot about how the mother was during pregnancy, her emotional state at that time, her physical state at that time. And that's how the remedy is prescribed for the child. And that's the one that actually works at the core level and actually works to kind of build on that child's immunity later on. But Amazing. of course, when the child does fall sick and gets those, you know, acute colds and cuffs and fevers, there's a whole new spectrum of remedies that kind of come into the picture at that time. And that's more of my kind of focus today to talk about, you know, when your child does fall sick and, uh, you know, what are the things that you can kind of have at home to be able to help keep up okay. with that. <laughs> While you're sharing your screen, uh, mommy's on the call. Thank you for joining. We've got lots more now on the call and I'm sure many more will join. Um, we are absolutely available here for your questions. So if you have anything, put them in the chat. Um, if they're relevant for the topic at hand, I will ask them immediately. Um, otherwise, we'll leave them to a little bit later when we have a bit of time for Q&A. Okay, perfect. So let me start, I think, a little bit with you understanding uh, my journey with homeopathy. And so I'll briefly run you through that. Uh, I was born uh, in a homeopathic family, so to say. My father is a homeopath. And so all my life, I have been treated with homeopathy. My sister has been treated with homeopathy. And for us, it was almost like a way of life. I mean, we didn't know another form of system of treatment. So whether it was measles or mumps or virals or fevers or anything, it was always homeopathy that was the only modality that we would use to treat ourselves. And so it was almost natural that, you know, my interest in it was very strong from growing up. And I started my journey um, in a homeopathic medical college, which was the first picture you can see right here, which was a six year program that I did uh, where we had hospital training, medical training, homeopathic training day in and day out for six years. And I graduated as a doctor of uh, homeopathic medicine uh, from that college. And then I went on to do my MD in pediatrics, which was another three year program. 
uh, where I did my uh, study in pneumonitis in children and respiratory diseases in children and how to work on it with homeopathy. And eventually joined my dad's practice, started working with him, uh, had a lot of clinical exposure there. I, I went to a lot of different courses all over the world, you know, tried to develop and see what was it that was interesting for me. And ultimately, it boiled down to me uh, understanding children. And I got into the aspect of neurology in children and autism. And that's when I started working with a pediatric neurologist and started my study in autistic children with homeopathy and did my PhD then later on with that in Vadia Hospital, which is the picture down there on the left. And that was a three-year study that I did trying to see, you know, if homeopathy improves the life and the, the symptoms of autistic children versus, you know, not giving homeopathy and giving a placebo. And um, eventually got my PhD then from the Homeopathic University in Jaipur, which is in India. And then life got me to Singapore. And so I started, you know, practicing in Singapore and using all of this decade of uh, knowledge and experience on my uh, patients over there. And uh, that's how my journey's kind of been in kind of coming to where I am, which yeah. I feel gives me a little bit of an edge in terms of I understand modern medicine. We've studied our anatomy, gynecology, internal medicine. We've done our dissections on human bodies. And so I have that aspect of it to kind of, you know, always know at the back of my head. But my interest and my focus is always in, you know, how to use nature around us to be able to heal those aspects. And so the modality that I will always use will either be homeopathy. I will either recommend some herbs. I'll give you some home remedies. It'll always be something that supports the body and supports the body to cure rather than me trying to give you a drug to be able to suppress what the body is actually trying to show. And I'm going to discuss that a little more in detail later as to what we're looking for in treating in these children, which is very important. So this is a little bit about uh, my journey. Uh, so let's get right into it. Let's get into homeopathy. A lot of you have heard about homeopathy. A lot of you have certain misconceptions also. Sometimes, you know, patients who come to my clinic and, you know, they've heard a few things. Some of it true, some of it not so much. So let me discuss a little more about it today. It started in the 18th century. It started in Germany. And uh, it started actually by a regular allopathic uh, medical practitioner over there by the name of Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, who was quite frustrated with the ongoing medical system. And he, he knew that there was, you know, something wrong. People weren't getting better. People are getting sicker. And we see that today because when I see my patients in the clinic and what research and studies show is that we're currently the sickest generation that's ever lived. We have the sickest children that have ever lived. The kind of diseases that we have now metabolically in children never existed even two decades ago. And so something that we're doing is still wrong. Something that the modern medicine system is doing is still not really going well with the way that we really want our children to kind of progress in. And this goes back to understanding you know, our roots, trying to understand what was it before, you know, what what have these kind of wise people always been saying all their lives, starting all the way from, you know, Greek philosophers to, you know, people like Dr. Samuel Hahnemann. So eventually he realized through his life that there was a better system. There was a way to use nature around him to be able to work on sick people. And that's how it all started in the year of uh, 1796. And 250 years later, homeopathy is now stronger than ever. We have uh, research going on in almost every country on trying to, you know, prove the benefits of homeopathy. And what I like to focus on is children, because I feel like it starts from there. It starts from there where, the, where when you build that foundational layer on that child, that's when you're going to be able to actually progress that child to a healthier adult. And so it means a lot to me. And it, I'm very passionate about telling mothers and teaching them about how to raise a healthy child. Because what sometimes happens is that when a mother comes into my clinic and she'd be like, you know, my child's immune system isn't great. And I don't believe that because I believe that every child is born with a very good immune system. It's what we're doing to it later on that's kind of, you know, hampering it. That's kind of, you know, causing and inviting more and more infections. That's inviting diseases. And so we're all born with such a great body, with such a great healthy functioning immune system. It's only a matter of nurturing it to be able to sustain a healthy life. You don't need to do anything more than that. You know, it's not rocket science. You just need to make sure that you're not damaging it any further. Mm -hmm. I do think that 
babies have a, a tougher start in life. You know, I'm thinking now of babies that are born prematurely and who from a very young age have been given homeopathy, uh, not homeopathy, sorry, antibiotics and so on. And I or I have never been given the chance to actually properly populate their um, microbiome, which ultimately is their immune system, you know? So I think some have need a little bit more help than others, but I would agree, you know, um, trusting the innate healing mechanisms of the body goes a very long way. Um, and I think that's where we we need to refrain from you overusing um, over-the-counter medicines, I think, and learn to discover different, more gentle ways, I think. So exactly. for joining us to help exactly. us. Exactly. And also, and also mothers say, right, that, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? Do we not do anything? I don't feel you should not do anything, you know, but there's a lot of other things you can do and which is important to know how to do and to trust that modality and the process of, you know, healing when your child is sick. So hopefully I'll give you a little more confidence by the end of this hour. And so let's go to the pillars of, you know, homeopathic prescribing. And these are the things that we rely on for every single prescription. Firstly is individualization. So homeopathy is like a tailor fit uh, prescription that every homeopath will give to you or your child. And so no two people with the same, you know, let's say two kids come to you with measles. Both the kids will get very different remedies based on the symptoms that they're projecting at that time. And you learn it later on right now when I discuss the remedies as to how there's so much of finer differentiation that goes on between remedies that we use for similar complaints as well. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the totality. So as a homeopath, we never treat a part. We never treat an organ. For me, if you come with, uh, let's say, a diabetes, I don't work only on your pancreas. I don't only work on your insulin metabolism. For me, I have to treat the person behind all of that. So we have to work on the person in terms of I have to understand their appetite. I have to understand, you know, how they drink. I have to understand their dreams, their personality, their sleep what they like eating, what their body is craving for, which part of the body the person sweats more on. Just very, very finer things that helps me understand your constitution. And so this also goes back to its roots in, you know, Ayurveda or TCM, where they pay a lot of emphasis on your body's, you know, heat and cold, on whether you're a phlegmy person, you're not a phlegmy person, you know, do you sweat more, do you not sweat more? Everything is very important in understanding the person so we can understand which remedy would then fit you the best. Minimum dose is, again, something as homeopaths we believe in strongly, which is we try to use as little of medication as possible. For us, just a simple nudge is enough to kind of, you know, nudge that immune system a little that, okay, you know, there's something wrong. You need to fix it. This is how you're going to fix it. And that little nudge is all we're looking for when we're working with homeopathy. We're not looking for heavy doses. We're not looking at 5 milligrams and 10 milligrams. It's just simple, small doses. And everything in homeopathy is made from nature. So everything around us, plants and animals and minerals and elements and everything is what we use in making our homeopathic remedies. So they're completely safe. They're always very, very, very well tested for decades before they kind of come into practice. And uh, I start using homeopathy all the way from day one of birth. And uh, it's completely safe in all potencies. Okay, so these are... Just, you know, things which you can use at home. I feel as a as a home prescriber, as a mother who's, you know, very keen on using homeopathy, I feel like, you know, this is a good outline for you to kind of have on using homeopathy. While, of course, you know, once you do get practice, you can use it for almost any and everything. And as a homeopath, I would prescribe it for everything. But uh, generally, I feel like at least the first, you know, line of treatment for your colds, coughs, fevers, tummy pain, colics, travel sickness, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, food poisoning, headaches, fatigue, you know, recovery post an infection or any skin complaints, boils, itching of the skin and things like that. It's very easy to use homeopathic remedies. And so what I do is I normally have a little uh, kit in the clinic labeled with all of these complaints and then the mothers just buy the kit and keep it with them wherever they're traveling. And it's a nice little, you know, handy thing like this like a tiny little box and you know I tell them to take it for their staycations or wherever they go and it's just easier you know that way because when you have the remedies it's much easier to use them rather than going and hunting you know when you start getting the symptoms for so, a very brief moment on how to store your homeopathic remedies because uh, so what I, 
So, and also how to travel with them because I've, you know, years and years and years ago, people would say you have to wrap them in aloe foil and they cannot go through the scanner and, you know, all of these things. I know, I agree. So the thing is, at least what I completely endorse is glass bottles and brown, you know, the brown glass, the amber glass bottles, because the potency still remain to kind of, you know, keep their power inside that. And that's all I do, you know, and then they're in a kit like this. I normally ask them to put it in the check-in bag and not in the carry-on because the carry-on goes through the scanners and things multiple times. Whereas the check-in bag, I'm not too sure. I'm sure it must be going through one or two scanners, but not as much. Yeah. And uh, no, I don't do the whole aluminum uh, wrapping, you know, just very easy. Just take the kit along. I feel the remedies are equally effective after. I mean, I carry all my remedies even from different parts of the world when they get shipped. I yeah. noticed that, you know, even the big pharmacies now are not really packing the remedies in uh, in foil and aluminum. So uh, I feel like the remedies are still kind of, you know, retaining their power. So I wouldn't worry too much. Keep it simple, you know, just make sure it's a glass bottle. It's an amber glass bottle. Keep it in a cool environment. You want to make sure it's not in direct sunlight ever because the pills melt and the potencies lose their power. But that's that's all, you know, that's the only two advice that I would give them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very quickly for a minute, I would like to touch on why your child gets sick, which is very important to understand. And so it all boils down to the whole germ theory versus your terrain theory. And um, I'm sure germ theory is something we're all very, very well aware of. It's what modern medicine thrives on. It's what COVID was all about. Um, it's what every infection that, you know, they come up, come up with is all about, which is basically to say that germs cause disease. So the crux of the theory is that when there's a virus, when there's a bacteria, when there's a parasite that enters your system, that's when you get sick. So infections cause disease. Now, this was something that was come up by uh, a very prominent physician, Louis Pasteur. We all have heard his name as well. And so he came up with that germ theory and he started working on it. Through his life, when he was working on it, there was another physician known as Claude Bernard. And now he came up with a very different theory called as the terrain theory. And now this is not something we've heard of. So I'll explain it a little more. So the terrain theory goes on to say that it's not the infection. So it's not the virus or the bacteria that's causing disease. It's actually our terrain, which is your immunity. So the, the way your body is, what's inside your body, which could also again be your microbiome, which is a part of your terrain. This is what determines if a child or an adult will get sick or not get sick. So this was a very different concept to be introduced at that time. Now, unfortunately, a terrain or an immune system is not very, very easy to, to sell. You cannot sell an immune system. You can sell a drug that you can patent for a particular infection. And so germ theory was something that really interested a lot of the guys who were invested into medicine and pharma at that time. And they felt like, you know, if we can get a medicine to treat certain infections, it's very easy to sell that, very easy to kind of, you know, propagate that uh, that idea. Whereas terrain theory did not pick up because it was not something that can be easily profited on. But when Claude Bernard worked through his life and he eventually did manage to prove that it was the terrain that causes us to become sick. And so I'll give you a reason why. There was a study which was done many years ago, which tested 4,000 individuals on their entire virome, which is to say that every virus in the body that is present in healthy individuals with no disease, with no symptoms, they had no manifestations of any of those infections. And so 4,000 individuals were tested at one point of time. And what they found out was that even in us as healthy human beings, we have so many latent viruses and bacteria, including your hep B and hep C and HIV and, you know, your Epstein-Barr virus present in almost all of us. And they're all lying dormant. They're lying absolutely quiet, causing no nuisance, no problem whatsoever. It is only when we trigger them with a low immunity. It's only when that stressor comes on. It's only when that mental or physical, you know, pressure comes on the system. That's when a lot of these latent infections get activated in our system. And so they can stay in our body for decades and years and we can die with them, but never die from them. Yeah. And it's important to understand those concepts because we're all, you know, kind of living in synchronicity with all of that. 
And when we're living in synchronicity, that's when we're going to be at a certain balance with the ecosystem. It's when we start attacking things and, you know, thinking of this as, you know, a bad thing and this infection is bad and this virus is bad and, you know, get into that defensive, destructive mode. That's when we're actually inviting problems into our system. I think the other problem with the terrain theory, in my humble opinion, is that it puts a lot of the responsibility on the patient. Hmm. It's then us who need to make sure, you know, to live healthy, to eat clean, to exercise, to go in the sun and all of these things. Whereas the doctor giving me just one pill, that seems a lot more easy, a lot easier than yeah. you know, going through all of this. I agree. I agree. Brooke, and just quickly, we have a question from Colleen. I will ask it a little bit later on, but I will definitely get to it. Uh, okay. in, he was talking okay. about how you find the right remedies and about your intake and so on. Okay. So anyway, so just closing this chapter, at the end of Louis Pasteur's life, some of his last words were, I was wrong, Claude was right, germ theory is nothing, terrain theory is everything. You will find this, a lot of it online. Unfortunately, our medical textbooks completely omit this part where Louis Pasteur admitted that, you know, the germ theory wasn't the cause of disease and it wasn't something that's making us sick, but it's, it's a nice uh, aspect to know. And so Again, you know, with the germ theory, when this fish is sick, we medicate the fish. Whereas in terrain theory, the whole concept is we have to clean the tank around, you know, and automatically the fish will learn to thrive in that new environment. So now, as I'm discussing a little bit about, you know, children and, you know, these are the most common complaints that, you know, mothers land up messaging me for, which is my child came back sick from school with a runny nose, went swimming, came back with a runny nose, there's a discharge, now my child started coughing. And these are things that really worry parents. And so I would like to take a minute again to, to help you not worry about it, which is to understand why this is happening, which is very, very important. Now, every time your child gets sick with an allergy or with an infection and there's a sneezing and there's a discharge coming out from the nose and it's, you know, that sticky kind of discharge, very important to understand what's happening. Now, this is the first line of defense that the body produces. The reason why the body is doing that is because those discharges are naturally antibiotic in nature. Those discharges are naturally anti-inflammatory in nature. And so the whole idea of the immune system being that I want to make it sticky around here, which is where most likely the infections entered, so I can catch on to it and throw it out of the system. That is what the main aim of the immune system will always be, will be to heal you, to try to help you as quickly and as fast as it can. And so when that sneezing comes on, it's a mechanism again for the body to throw out the discharge, expel the discharge. Again, cough is a similar modality, right? We want to remove that from the system. Vomiting, when you get a food, uh, when you get a food poisoning or an infection in the gut, and that's when you land up vomiting because the body is trying to again eliminate that infection, which is the fastest way actually for the body to get rid of it. But when our approach is that we want to stop the symptom, it becomes very disturbing for the body then because now it's lost its ability to use its actual natural defenses. So when you use a, a nose drops, let's say, for example, you know, to stop that runny nose or you use, you know, a, a cuff syrup to make the cuff stop, all that has done is actually stopped the response of the body. None of these medications work on the infection. None of these medications work on actually decreasing the time that your child is sick. But you've actually put your child in a little more distress now because at that point of time, that expel mechanism is lost. And so when you're working with symptoms, it's very important to understand that you're not working to suppress them. You're working at the layer beneath that. You're working at the root cause. You're working at supporting the immune system. So if that you know, discharge is there, that's fine. But you want to make sure that the discharge isn't very disturbing. If the fever is there, that's fine. You want to support the immune system to work on the infection, but you want to make sure the child is not dehydrated. You want to make sure the child is not getting lethargic. And so you work on aspects that are actually important rather than focusing your energies on symptoms that are not lethal in the first place or that are not dangerous in the first place, you know. And you let the body play it out. When the body plays it out, the body has that much knowledge for the next step episode to be able to know exactly what to do and most of the times the episodes will be much shorter they'll come much more spaced apart rather than when you suppress symptoms and then you know the next two weeks your child's sick again and then the next two weeks your child's sick again and because you haven't allowed the body to resolve that infection the body will keep trying to do it again and again and again 
till the time you give it a chance to actually get that resolution and closure from that infection. And that becomes very important for mothers to understand when they're working with this. That's a really, really important point. And mummies, this doesn't mean that you can't give your children symptomatic relief. We definitely want to keep a child, you know, happy and, and content, but we need to give the body a chance to heal as well. And there's so many nice ways to do that, right? So when you have the runny nose, I always recommend eucalyptus oil. I'll recommend steaming. I have a club oil that I, you know, like to dispense from the clinic. And so just inhalations with all of that gives the child or the adult so much relief with their respiratory complaints. You know, they don't really need to opt in for the nose drops already. And so I feel like homeopathy is a great first line of treatment when it comes to all of this. I will never advise against allopathic medications when you need to. But you have to give homeopathy and you have to give, you know, your body a chance before you opt for it. I don't endorse, you know, the, oh, my, my child started with her, you know, a little bit of a temperature and, you know, quick to give a Panadol, quick to, you know, kind of dispense medications. Even pediatricians now will advise you that you have to, you know, wait till a certain degree before, you know, you start using the medications. You have to wait till a certain point and that patience and that kind of, you know, um, system of working will actually benefit your child in the long run mm. okay so finally let's get to the homeopathic remedies oh actually Rukshin this might yeah. be a really good point uh yes. to ask before because Colleen wanted to know all the details that you need to know you mentioned for example where one perspires the most or what dreams one has how much is enough for you to give a sound diagnosis is this a trial and error or is this a matter of, you know, how many symptoms um, fit the one remedy? Can you talk a little bit about how you find out which is the suitable remedy for this child? Okay, or okay, okay. So, um, so what we do is, uh, and so I think let's go back to how homeopathic remedies and how our literature kind of comes about, which is that when we decide to introduce a certain remedy in the literature of homeopathy, that remedy is actually taken by healthy adults and there is a whole list of symptoms that comes out of taking that remedy. So, for example, if all of us today were to try to prove a remedy of an onion and, you know, we all ingested that remedy, all of us will come up and prove certain symptoms. So we will come out with a certain, you know, part of the body that, you know, we're landing up sweating up more on or we'll have certain cravings or there'll be certain physical symptoms that will come up. And so there is somebody in charge of that. So we call it a proving. And so there's somebody in charge of that proving who will make a list of all the symptoms that, you know, all the provers are getting. Then from that list, a lot of it is filtered out based on, you know, understanding the person who's proving the remedy. There's an elimination process that goes on because of that. And then by the end of it, we have a set list of symptoms that most of the provers landed up getting which would contain in a broad category, three different kinds of symptoms. One would be mental and emotional symptoms. One would be just physical symptoms, which would be either pain related or a sensation or, you know, something like that. And the other would be a general symptom, which would be their sweating, their cravings, their aversions, how they slept, what position they preferred to sleep on when they were taking the remedy and so on and so forth. And this process goes on for weeks and months till we get this final list of, you know, symptoms for each remedy. Then that particular picture is put up, you know, with all the other remedies in our encyclopedia of, you know, all the remedies. And after that, when a child comes to me, it is for the homeopathic practitioner to actually assess based on the symptoms I got as to which of the 10,000 pictures that I have now in my encyclopedia fit this child the best. And so it's not the easiest process in terms of, you know, a home prescriber to do, or, you know, for somebody who's just starting out to do, this is something that builds on with experience where you learn to decide, you know, what's important to take, what's not important to take. So definitely not a trial and error. It's more of an experience process, I would say, where you then know exactly which remedy would fit this child the best after understanding, you know, their mental, emotional state, their past history, their family history, and all of the other symptoms that I kind of discussed earlier. And um, it's a matter of, you know, kind of going back to the reference books. We have certain softwares that also now make it easy for us and help us decide, you know, which remedies come close to this child and then kind of evaluating and deciding which is the best fit for this child at that point of time. I will want to add, though, as a mom, not a practitioner or anything, as a mom trying out remedies on my children, Yes, sometimes it is trial and error because the child has a cough and you have 
seven different remedies that could potentially, you know, be a fit. And you're sort of trying to find your feet and trying to find what fits the best. And so you will try one. And if that doesn't show a reaction or nothing changes, then you might try another. So yeah. just for acute, obviously not having a homeopath at two o'clock in the morning that you can call, you know. That's correct. And that and that works. That works. And so a lot of the times you will land up, you know, even as you start prescribing yourself at home, you will realize that there are these certain remedies that will keep coming up more than more often than the others, which will work very well on your child. And so every child I feel has a certain set of remedies that work very well for their colds and their fevers. And, you know, repeatedly the body's asking for that same herb or that same remedy again and again in different forms. And mothers are very quick to know that. So most of the times if patients with been with me for like three months plus, they would automatically mess with my child has a run, you know, da, 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 da. should I give this remedy? Should I do this? And most of the times they land up getting it correct. So they know, you know, after two or three times, what is the best fit for their child. So it becomes very easy then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have yes. one question from Pretty that I'll quickly do. Yes. Be and Waylin, please wait a little bit because we will see um, if there are any remedies for skin and so on in the in in the presentation. Pretty is asking, and I'd like to respond quickly. Is steaming recommended for infants as well? So steaming as a naturopath, I have to tell you, steaming you need to know what you're doing. It's a bit controversial. It depends on how the patient or the the, the uh, kid presents. Because depending on whether you already have a lot of inflammation, you don't want to add more heat, for example. But there are other ways of inhaling that don't necessarily involve steam. You could have a cold in inhalation, for example. But this is a bit too complex. But to Rukshin, homeopathy, is it recommended for infants? Or for infants, is it better to use allopathy? For a nose block? No, no, for anything is is. Oh she's... no, definitely homeopathy, definitely, definitely. As I said, I use it from day one of birth, and the whole reason why we're kind of talking about this today is to give parents an option to use a little more gentler form of medication rather than using, you know, drugs. See, at the end of the day, while you know allopathy has become very common in our day-to-day -day life for our body and for a child's body it's still a foreign substance it's something that the liver still doesn't know how to process it's something that the liver still has to figure out how to detox it's still a chemical that's made in a laboratory that's being introduced you know to your child at that age and so while a lot of the children will show no negative reaction to it immediately it's all a build-up we want to make sure that we're exposing the child as little as possible to anything that the body is not happy doing. And so I know for a fact that when you're giving, you know, anything which is a chemical or a drug substance, the body is going to have a memory of that and respond to it negatively at some point in the future. And so if we want to, if we can avoid it as much as we can, that would always be the best option. Of course, when we need to use it, we need to use it, we do it. You know, and it, it works miracles, it works wonders. And, you know, in those situations when we need to use it, I would be all for it. But not for cuffs and colds and fevers and, you know, simple things that can be easily managed at home. Okay, I'll let you go into the remedies and then yes. I'll okay. time for Waylon's question. Okay. Okay, perfect. So what I've done is I've tried to do a little bit of a of a picture diagram thing. So it's easy for y'all to uh, to understand. Of course, I don't expect y'all to remember it's not a class and uh, you will have all of this information at the end of it on paper. So you can refer back to it, but I'll just go through it very briefly. So arsenic album is one of the most commonly used, you know, first remedies that I like to kind of give because uh, it has a lot of the symptoms that you know our kids have at the first sign of an exposure to uh, any kind of an infection so when a child comes you know back from school with a watery nose with a runny nose with uh, sneezing generally my first prescription would be to tell them to start arsenic album and it normally lands up nipping it in the bud and we land up you know having just a 24 hour episode and then the next day the child's back to school and you know everything's fine so it's a good remedy that I like to use when, you know, symptoms like this start. Generally, we see it more when there's a cold weather outside. Uh, now, again, you know, a lot of this might seem strange to you, but this is what we need when we're prescribing as homeopaths. So any symptoms that tend to get worse during midday or midnight is a very typical indication for us to use arsenic album. So when you have a child that, you know, lands up getting up around, you know, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock or 1 a.m., 
and lands up getting up from bed and having a whole coughing fit or an asthmatic fit. Arsenic album, again, works very well for that because it, it satisfies that time modality of having a midday or a midnight aggravation. Uh, the kids will normally be uh, thirsty for sips of water. The thirst won't be too much when you're, when you're kind of working with these kids. It's also an excellent remedy for the tummy aspect of it. So for any kind of food poisoning or vomiting or watery stools and, you know, uh, for this Bali belly, a lot of the mothers, you know, land up taking the kids to Bali and, you know, the kids land up getting sick. Arsenic alb again becomes a very good remedy to subside those symptoms at that point of time. And I also use it very frequently for fevers, especially fevers where the head is very hot, but the entire body, the mother says, is pretty cool to touch. You know, the fever's more on the head, more on the face, and the rest of the body feels like it's fine. And Arsal works very well for those kind of situations. So a very good handy remedy to keep and, you know, use uh, frequently if you need to. I'll discuss the dosage absolutely at the end of all the remedies. Now, Arnica. Arnica is something we all have heard of uh, very often. I'm sure every mother has this remedy with them. Um, it's excellent for, for any kind of falls, injuries, bruising, bleeding, where there's swelling. Generally, Arnica would be something you would give immediately at that point of time and then repeat it, you know, frequently through the day to make sure that the bleeding stops, to make sure that you're arresting that internal hemorrhage. So again, very good even during the pain for during and after delivery for the hemorrhages that happen during, you know, delivering a child. We use Arnica a lot for that as well. Can I and, yes something here as the herbalist? Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a difference between Arnica the herb and a homeopathic remedy of Arnica. Arnica is actually one of the schedule three herbs, which I have to keep under lock and key because they can be so toxic to the body. But maybe this is a time, Rukshin, for you to explain how these very toxic substances are often our best homeopathic remedies and how the herb is different from the granules that we we consume in homeopathy. Okay. Um, so... Uh... Let me probably then discuss how the remedies are made. And so, for example, when we're working with Arnica and um, initially all of this process used to happen by hand in the early 1900s and 1800s. It was only very recently that now we have pharmaceutical, you know, machines that are doing this work for us, which is quite a tedious work. Uh, so we start off with the herb. So the herb is first kind of collected. There's a certain season when, you know, every herb needs to be picked up. There's a certain area where every herb, you know, grows the best. And so we have a whole uh, pharmacopoeia that kind of instructs pharmacies on where to take it from, how to take it, which part of the plant to take. So in some cases, we only use flowers. In some cases, we use the whole plant and so on and so forth. And so for Arnica, for example, when we're working with it, right? So we would take the plant and then it's kept in alcohol over a period of a few weeks to make sure that we're kind of extracting as much substance from the Arnica into the alcohol as possible. And so it's kind of seeped and stored there for a couple of weeks, after which the whole process of making the remedy starts. So the way that homeopathic remedies are made is that we do not want the physical aspect of the substance as much as we want the, if I would just, just put it in very easy words, the energetic aspect of the substance. But if we want to talk about it more scientifically, then it boils down to taking the quantum particle of that substance. And um, so what we're working on is we, when that herb is put into alcohol, the powers of it seeped inside. One part of that alcohol then mixed with another 10 parts of just, you know, regular diluting substance, whether it's water or it's alcohol. So we always work in a one is to 10 ratio where the herb is one part and where the diluting substance is the other 10 parts. And so from that is made our very first potency, which we would call as the X potency or the one X potency. From that substance, again, one part is taken and mixed with another 10 parts of the diluting substance. And that makes our 2x potency. And so similarly, so on and so forth, we go up to 100x and 200x and we go into the C potency, which is a 1 is to 100 ratio of kind of making the remedy. And so when we're doing that, beyond a certain number, we cross Avogadro's number, which is the 10 is to 23 ratio. Um, getting a little technical here, but when we cross that ratio in the microscope or under any kind of, you know, 
through the naked eye, we cannot see the substance anymore. We lose that substance. But what's left behind, as I mentioned, is the quantum particle of that substance or the energetic aspect of the substance that we are working on when we're using the remedy. And so, for example, the potency that I like to normally use for acute conditions is a 200C. Now, when we say 200C, that is 1 is to 100. So we're starting with just one part of that herb mixed with 100 parts of the diluting substance to make a 1C. And then one part from that, again, mixed with 100 parts of a diluting substance to make a 2C. And so similarly, that 1 is to 100 thing happens 200 times before you actually have a liquid remedy in front of you, from which we add four drops into a bottle of pills, and that's what you're getting as a, as a client. So coming back to Annika, if you're using it on the skin, you need to make sure, and especially if there's an open wound, uh, because you mentioned bleeding here, yes, you have to make sure that this is actually homeopathic Annika. Yes. And you will see that on the label by having a, the potency like C10 or C200 or D200 or whatever it is. Uh, but if it says Annika herb, then you can't put it on an open wound because it is extremely toxic. Um, I have a question here too by Marta, who uh -huh. was referring to the previous slide of our uh -huh. album. And she says, should we notice the first symptoms or wait to give the body an opportunity to heal? Which is an excellent question because that's what we said earlier. We don't want to suppress symptoms. Correct. Is, but homeopathy works in a very different way than pa paracetamol, for example. So do you want to explain how that works? Yeah, sure. sure. So the thing is that these are the symptoms that we look out for when we want to prescribe a remedy. And so observation is a skill of a homeopath or for a home prescriber as well, you know, to know exactly what we're looking for. And this is when I discuss these symptoms, this is what you're looking for. But the way that it will work when you give an arsenic album for these kind of symptoms is that we are not looking at getting rid of the symptoms when we're giving arsenic alb. So you will notice that the symptoms might still persist. The intensity of the infection will decrease. The child will now, you know, slowly decrease the discharge that's coming out of the of the nose. The child will slowly feel a little more energetic. The child will be a little more responsive. The child will want to now eat food. The child will now want to, you know, kind of go out and play or, you know, get up from their bed. And so we're looking at these little small, 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 small things to make sure that the remedy is working rather than, you know, giving a remedy. So you give an arsenic album at 12 o'clock and you don't expect that by 12, 15, you know, the symptoms are gone. No, that's not at all what we're expecting. What we're expecting is slowly and steadily, the remedy takes control of the immune system, nudges the immune system to kind of work by itself. And so if you have a good functional, well, you know, balanced immune system, most likely remedies work very fast. And I've seen that time and time again, they can work in as quick as 10 and 15 minutes where, you know, your body will take control and, you know, the symptoms are gone. But Sometimes when the child is not very well equipped with their immune system, it can take a little longer to work. And so it won't work the same way as paracetamol works, where we're trying to just put a mask over the symptoms. The whole idea is that we're giving the remedy to get rid of the symptoms in a way that when the symptoms go, you don't have to give the remedy again because the symptoms will come back, you know, once the effect of the remedy is gone away. It doesn't work that, you know, every six hours the symptoms come back and you need to give the remedy again. That's not at all what we're looking for. We're looking for a more long lasting, permanent, you know, you know, solution to the whole symptoms that are coming up. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, I have a very quick one. Someone... Yeah in the chat but people have been using allopathic medicine since ages for simple ailments and they are good my response to that would be in fact our modern medicine is actually very very young compared to the traditions of using herbs for millennia yeah so uh th that would be my response and i keep it very short because i could talk about this forever <laughs> rather uh, focus on the remedies that you have. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, again, you know, kind of just retouch that point in terms of, I don't, I don't uh, advise you to not take allopathy. See, every system of medicine has its own place, you know, let's give it that place. Let's give it that respect and that honor. But at the same time, we have to understand when what is required. You know, if your knee is broken, I am not going to ask you to take homeopathic remedies, you know, go to the hospital get it fixed get a surgery done you know get whatever you need to at that point of time when you get into an accident or whatever it is but when your child is having a runny nose 
I don't expect you to rush to the A&E, you know, I don't expect you because all of this is workable at home. And so the whole idea of my talk is not to tell you to not take allopathy. The whole idea is for you to explore and give homeopathy a chance. And so, you know, in case that didn't come across. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about belladonna. Belladonna is again a very, very good remedy for mothers to have uh, in their kits. And the whole thing that we're looking for with belladonna is redness and congestion. And so whether it be red cheeks, whether it be a red throat, whether it be, you know, just completely infl inflamed body, wherever it is. So whether even if we're working on the skin, for example, a lot of, I, I heard you say skin complaints, right? So even when there's a lot of redness and, you know, just that, that fiery red inflammation that you see anywhere, think of belladonna as the remedy for those situations. So the fever is again very high. You, you know, your child will come home from school, suddenly everything's fine. In the next one hour, they're already having a 102, 103 degree fever, you know, so the fever shoots up very quickly. So that inflammation is very strong with belladonna. When you see that strength in the inflammation, always think of this remedy. And so a lot of intensity in their pains, a lot of intensity, you know, in the complaints, a, a very good remedy that I use for strep throat or for any kind of throat infections. Very good remedy for viral fevers also, because you see a similar, you know, set of symptoms most of the time. And so a good remedy to kind of have on board. Now, bryonia. Bryonia is another uh, herb that we use very, very uh, frequently used with kids. Again, you see a very high fever, but the whole uh, time when you will think of bryonia is when you've gone to the beach, for example, had a very lovely day in Sentosa, you know, in the beach clubs and had a really nice cold coconut over there. And then you come down home and then you're down with, you know, either a cough or a runny nose or a headache and you're wondering what to do about it, then bryonia becomes a very prominent remedy because anytime that it's really hot outside and you've landed up cooling your body and get symptoms after that particular episode, bryonia works very well for that. So even when, you know, you have those kind of weathers where the days are very hot and the nights become very cold or, you know, we are in a, let's say a Dubai kind of, a, you know, a place or a desert kind of a place where there's, you know, that dry heat which is present and then you land up having cold and you get certain symptoms. That's when bryonia works very well. So high fevers, dry cough, especially more in the daytime, a runny nose, they're very thirsty, complaints after a sun, cold drink on a sunny day. And very good for heat strokes. Yes, any kind of heat-related, sun-related complaints, bryonia works very well. Now, chamomilla is something we get a lot over the counter. Mothers know this herb very, very well. And so we use it as a homeopathic remedy as well. Uh, for all kinds of teething complaints, it's the first go-to remedy without, you know, even understanding the rest of it. You know, there's a teething complaint. Mothers can use uh, chamomilla for that. Uh, we see a lot of dentitional diarrhea, which is, you know, the teething diarrhea that we see, which is green color generally. Chamomilla works well for that. The child is, of course, very irritable, very cranky, constantly wants to be carried. You know, there's nothing that's kind of soothing this child and you constantly need to kind of be physically present to soothe this child and soothe this child and carry the child and nothing makes it better. Colic pains, I've used it very, very, very successfully for a lot of kids who come to me at that six-week mark, you know, when there's typically colic pains that start worse in the night, nothing soothes the child, very gassy, very gastric disturbed child, chamomilla works very well. And another thing we use it for is for ear pains. So uh, with kids who have any kind of ear complaints, which get which they feel better when there's any warm application, again, chamomilla works very, very well for that. Oscillococcinum. Uh, is a remedy which is again very important and this is where the prophylactic part comes in and so you see it in a lot of European pharmacies you know just being sold over the counter and the research suggests that it acts as a great prophylactic for all of these kind of viruses which is what Singapore is loaded with so which is your influenza type A your H1N1 para-influenza entro adeno rio herpes all of these viruses you I have it again, you know, sometimes in my kit and uh, whenever a mother feels like they're going to go to a place where there's, you know, a lot of COVID cases or a lot of, you know, flu going around in that area. And so in that situation as a prophylactic, it's a good idea to take, you know, a dose for a few days for the whole family. Mm -hmm. And now lastly, I've put up a few commonly used cough remedies and uh, we'll just do the very basics of it. So sanguinaria is again a herb that we land up using as a remedy in homeopathy. And the main crux of sanguinaria is for one of those cuffs which come on in the middle of the night 
and disturb the child's sleep and land the child lands up coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing and then there's a vomit and then sanguinaria works very very well now similar to that is a remedy aurelia which is also a herb where again the cough is in the night but this time the cough is a more phlegmy cough so more you know loose cough the mother tells you that you know i can hear the mucus you know every time the child is coughing and so again disturbing the sleep comes on in the middle of the night the child cannot sleep all night but in aurelia we don't see a lot of the vomiting or we don't see a lot of the tummy complaints coming on and so that kind of differentiates both the remedies again pertussin is a remedy i use very often for coughs i ask mothers to give you know one dose before the child sleeps when the child is prone to coughing in their sleep and this is more of a whooping cough more of a choking with the cough or a croupy kind of a cough um i don't know if these words make sense to you all but you all can just uh, google it and hear the different kinds of coughs and uh, so a croupy cough is generally you know which has a little uh, sound at the end of the cough and a constant cough that comes on so pertussin works very very well for that and then spongia spongia is something i use very often when the cough gets triggered after having chocolate so a lot of the times mothers will be like you know my kids gone for a lot of lot of birthday parties there's a lot of cake that's happened and now there's a cough that's come on and that's when spongia works very well and with spongia the cough is again this barky kind of you know dry croupy kind of a cough uh another remedy that i just thought of which would be good for singapore mothers is uh, chlorim so that's a remedy i use very often for complaints after swimming so it's actually made from chlorine and uh, it's for the kids who have side effects from the chlorine we land up using the remedy chlorim and again i ask them to give four pills before swimming and four pills after swimming and generally the kids who are prone to getting sick after that land up you know doing just fine so uh, that's a remedy i land up using pretty uh, often as well amazing yes going to talk quickly about dosing or yes. uh, and um prophylactically versus um acute sure so the potencies that i like to use so the potency is the power of all of these remedies which i like to use is either a 12 a 30 or a 200 i feel like as new practitioners it's always nicer to stick to 12 or 30 once you feel like you're a little more experienced it's good to go up to 200 and so the whole concept of the potency is being that the more the energy of the of the attack the higher the energy of your remedy so when you're working with a virus you know that's really strong that's aggressive that's come on you know very uh, suddenly into the system you try to use a more higher potency whereas something that you can deal with a little easier you try to use lower potencies i like to use 200 potencies for because i am prescribing to the patients and so i feel comfortable doing a 200 c potency for them now the dosage is determined by the intensity so if you have a mild symptoms and this is just a general you know broad criteria that i've made mild symptoms do two times a day moderate symptoms do a dosage three times a day and if it's very severe go to four times a day and the dosage would remain the same for all the kids one year and above and uh, this is what generally works well the reason why i say four times a day is because sometimes you need to keep you know stimulating the body system because the the frequency or the energy of the attack is a little stronger at that time and so we need to kind of work with that i have a question here rukshin before yes. you go uh because this is um from um a mom who says can the kit be purchased directly from the clinic is one yes. aspect the other one is is it applicable or can it be used for four, a four month old baby for a four month old yes of course as i said i start from day one of birth for kids i would prefer to uh, to be the person uh, who you go to for a child that's 4 month old rather than a lot of self prescribing just to be on the safer side i'm not saying you can't do it but you know just if you're completely new to the process yes i would prefer that you know you skip the trial and error part with a 4 month old and we just yeah. you know prescribe only what's absolutely required um the kits can be purchased from me directly at the clinic i'm at orchard uh, joanna can give you the details later and um, Yes what was the other bit uh, yes we can use it for kids you can use so the kit is actually something which the whole family uses because the same remedy will be for an adult who's 50 years old and for a child who's 4 years old so it's it's very handy to kind of have with you amazing okay mm-hmm. i'll let you move on to the next slide i have yes. a big question on uh, skin in a minute <laughs> okay okay so now um 
generally you start feeling better within the first 24 to 48 hours. If you are feeling better, then it's safe to kind of continue them till the symptoms persist. You don't need to take them for a set duration of time. You start feeling better today morning. By today evening, please feel free to stop taking the remedy. You don't need to keep it on for too long. But if you feel like there's been, you know, already 24 hours of taking the remedy and you haven't noticed any benefit from it, there are two things you can do. The first thing is you try to, if you feel like the remedy is still, you know, the one that's kind of fit for your child, you go up a potency. So if you're already on a 30C, you go to a 200C or you decide and, you know, you see maybe there's another remedy that's a little more better suited for that situation. Can and I then, add yes. something for explanation? Because this is not like giving two paracetamol instead of one. You actually have to change the potency. So if you're working with a C30, you have to switch to a different remedy that you have to buy, not yes. get more of the same. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes, um, so that's it. Yes. Your question. Question. Now, so my eight months old who didn't have skin issues started to get eczema patches all over her uh, after her six month jabs. Oops, sorry, I've lost my thing. Um, sorry. Took her to a doctor last week and he prescribed an antihistamine, a oh. steroid oral medicine, prednisolone, and a steroid, a uh, 1% hydrocortisone cream. What is the homeopathic understanding regarding eczema flare-ups and what would the alternative approach to treat it look like? And here, I think we're getting more into a constitutional issue. Understood. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of eczema and, you know, Singapore is flooded with, uh, with eczema patients. I think the current stats show that almost 20% of uh, of kids in Singapore have eczema at some point in their life. And half of those that get eczema in Singapore actually have eczema their entire life. And so it's pretty sad to see that, you know, a condition that can be treated pretty easily using, uh, you know, the approach of working on the immune system, you know, kind of the kids have to suffer so much. And so I have a lot of eczema patients. Now, the reason why eczema happens, you have to again go back and understand that, which is an underlying allergy in the immune system. So it's an allergic disorder. Now, what the child is allergic to is impossible to tell. It could be a food. It could be something they're putting on their body. It could be a fragrance in the air. It could be the laundry detergent you're using. It could be X number of things. Now, while we can reduce the toxic load by me, you know, advising you or even if you kind of, you know, do your own research, you know what to use, what not to use on your child. The best way to approach it is to work from the inside. So what's happening is that when there is any kind of allergic disorder in the system, it's the body's way of kind of shouting out loud for something that doesn't need to be, you know, made into such a big deal. So it's an hyper response of the immune system. So it's a small trigger that, you know, me and you don't react at all to, but that child system finds it as a very dangerous substance. And the child kind of wants to scream out and say that, you know, this is not, you know, something that I'm happy working with. The liver's not being able to detox it. I need to, you know, kind of not have this exposure to the system. And so the way to work on this is to explain to the system and to kind of numb it down to a point where it realizes that, you know, this is not dangerous. This is something that you can live with. This is something that can be detoxed from the system. And so we decrease the reactivity of the body to that particular allergen. And that's the only way to actually work on it. If you want to make sure that the cure is, you know, a little more long term and permanent and you don't need to use this. With steroids, with any kind of local application that you do on skin complaints, it's very temporary. It's very, you know, at that time, things can get better, maybe for a week or two, maybe for a month or two sometimes. And then the eruptions will come back because you haven't addressed what the body is trying to tell you. So when there is any kind of skin eruption, it's the body's easiest way to express that there's something that it's kind of going wrong inside and you need to fix that. When you're going to put layers of creams on it, it's going to fix it temporarily, never permanently. And so you need to kind of accept an approach that is more holistic in nature. And so even, you know, when let's say whether it be homeopathy or naturopathy, the main way to work on it is to work from all the angles. So you work on your gut health, you work on the microbiome, you work on the body's immune system. You make sure that every toxin that the body is kind of coming in contact with is reduced to as much as is in your hands to kind of reduce. And you make sure that there's no fragrances going on in the child's, you know, products or cosmetics. You make sure that they're as natural and uh, conservative or as herbal as possible. Um, 
when it comes to diet and nutrition, you make sure that this child is staying as away from inflammatory foods as possible. So your sugars and processed foods and, and things like that. And of course, if you've identified a food trigger for the child, definitely make sure that you're kind of refraining from that trigger as much as possible. But when you're giving a proper constitutional homeopathic treatment and we're working on all these aspects that I said, it's very easy for the child's body to then come out of that. And so most of the cases when I work with the eczema, the ones that, you know, are most of them are easy. Most of them, you know, within the first six months, we can see excellent results where the eruptions completely subside down, the itching goes down, the inflammation goes down. And we're able to mainly keep this child off any kind of uh, steroid creams, which is what uh, my main aim is, you know, to kind of avoid that as much as possible. So. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I know. Can you stop sharing your slides for 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 a um minute? Which one? Can you stop sharing? Stop so, sharing. Yes, 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 yes. You can see your face. Um, I wanted. That, there's another question on eczema that I wanted to uh, quickly read out. My daughter started with eczema, and against the doctor's advice, sorry, um, I took cow's milk, and she got ninety percent. I I think she got took cow's milk out of her diet and she got 90% better. The remaining 10% was where I started using the correct shower gel. I started using, using Bioderma. Oh, sorry, that's just the sharing, not a question. But I have a good question here, which is where can we purchase or order homeopathy in Singapore? In Europe, it's available at every pharmacy. Yes, it is. But it's super hard to find homeopathic remedies here. So there's no pharmacy that Singapore has. And I am my own pharmacy. I have managed to build a pharmacy over the past five years in Singapore now by trying to order in, you know, everything from different parts. And so anyone who needs homeopathic remedies, I am very happy to dispense them to you. And, uh, you know, without you even being a patient of mine, I am open to kind of giving out the remedies as per whatever you need, because I, oh uh, yeah. That's really you great. Reach out. Yes. Another source that I found very good is helios.co.uk. Uh, they send pretty swiftly. It usually yes. takes five days to arrive and they really have the whole array. Uh, there, if you order yourself, the problem is you have to know what potency you want. You have to know what pill form you want. Do you want dissolvable tablets? Do you want poppy seed granules? Do you want whatever? Yes. So it can become a little bit more... Yes. So you're buying quite a lot for and you're only going to use a tiny amount so maybe we'll exactly. share that might be a bit of exactly and also then the shipping costs and all of that right and helios is expensive so yes i'm happy to help out in those situations um, <laughs> thank thanks a lot for this insight <laughs> sorry thanks a lot for insightful sessions as someone I need to uh, draw definitely makes you think about a more holistic approach so that's great and that's what we're we're aiming to do with this session thank you so much Rukshin you oh, have wealth of information obviously and tons <laughs> of experience so it is so so um um great that you could make it for this session and we're eternally eternally grateful for you my pleasure stopping by and we will share this um, video on our YouTube channel. And then I hope I will put all your details down on uh, down below so people can find you in person. OK, OK, Thank you so much. You. Thank you so much, mummies. We had such a great turnout. We had over th uh, over 30 mummies and daddies on the call. So that was really amazing. Thank you so much. Lovely. See you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, I'll see you later. Bye, Joanna. Thank you for having Bye. me.